All right, everybody. Um, so my name is Pam Block. I'm an anthropology professor at Western University. And um, I am a disability anthropologist. Um, I have been focusing on sort of cultural perspectives on disability and disability culture for um, a couple of decades now. And I've been at Western for just over two years. And for the past uh, year or so, we have uh, been designing an international program to um, bring students every year to Brazil, both in person and virtually. Behind me, you can't see her, but you can hear her chewing on the bone, is my dog, Sammy. Um, so my, um, uh, I've been working, I've been doing collaborative research and studying disability in Brazil since the early uh, to mid 1990s. My dissertation research had to do with the history of intellectual disability and the eugenics movements in Brazil and the United States. So it's always been a very intersectional approach, looking at race and gender uh, and social status as well as disability. And um, so I have relationships that are decades old in all over Brazil, but our international program is based um, at the, the um, Núcleo de Estudos de Deficiencia, the, the, the Center for Disability Studies at uh, the uh, Federal University of Santa Catarina in Florianopolis, Brazil. And we chose that location because that is one of the most, um, it's, it's, it's a center for, for disability studies research um, in the country. And I have very strong relationships with colleagues there. So this, inter, this international program is jointly, sorry, grab the bone from the dog. Um, the program is jointly administered um, with uh, and co-led by my colleague Maravecchi Gesser, who is a psychologist, a social psychologist um, at the Federal University of Santa Catarina. And also um, we have the assistance of anthropologist Anaí Guedes de Mello, uh, who is a disabled um, and small D deaf uh, anthropologist. And um, so, of course, right when we started designing this program and got the funding, um, COVID hit. And um, so we designed for last year a virtual program. And we're going to keep a virtual component. So if people can't travel to Brazil, um, we're hoping that there will still be virtual um, opportunities for virtual exchange. But we also hope that now that um, uh, we have permission from the university, we'll be able to take a small group of people down in person to Brazil in May of 2022. And this will, of course, depend on the safety issues and whatever, you know, might be happening in the intervening months. But as of right now, um, southern Brazil is a very um, safe area. Um, people are highly vaccinated. And um, numbers, uh, the numbers have been much lower in that part of Brazil compared to the rest of Brazil. And uh, so we, so even though right now they're still on lockdown and they're expecting to be, um, you know, have um, COVID restrictions in uh, place, uh, I believe at least until um, like through the summer and during our exchange, we will probably, you know, be masking and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. We're gonna, we're gonna um, you know, keep all COVID precautions. However, it should be possible for us to um, engage uh, through, you know, to, to learn, to engage in activities, um, both virtually and in person and to do um, socially distanced activities um, while we were down in Brazil. That could include, um, you know, going to rest, you know, going, eating Brazilian food, going to the beach, going to museums, um, engaging in um, cultural exchanges, visiting organizations, talking with activists. And um, there will be an opportunity, we're still working on the details of it, but there will be an opportunity to um, uh, ha engage in a course um, either as an audit or potentially we're, we're just working on the pathways, but there's, there's possibilities of, um, of four credit options for both undergraduates and graduate students 
Um, but that would be at this point, um, last year we were able to do this through UFSKI so that students could, undergraduate students could take courses at UFSKI and, um, and, the, and for free because it, uh, education is free in Brazil, higher education, um, and then have the credits transferred. We're not sure if that's going to be possible this year. Um, it was not and will not be possible for graduate students. Graduate students who want graduate credit would have to arrange for an independent study with me, which would probably, we would time it for the fall so that um, people's existing funding could cover it if you want. Um, but we would do a lot of the activities for the course during the summer, but then the like written assignments, the evaluation component, um, we could postpone to in the until the fall for graduate students. For undergraduate students, we could um, students would um, if either we'll be able to do it through UFSKI, in which case it will be free, or if if it turns out not to be possible, then uh, it would also have to be an independent study um, option, which could be over the summer um, or in the fall. We could we could just work on you know figure that out individually for students. Um, the, the, I'm going to let, I'm going to step back for a second and, and, um, have Michaela talk about her experiences with the virtual exchange, um, this past summer. Yes. Hi. Hello. Um, my name is Michaela. Um, nice to meet whoever you are that's watching this. Um, and yeah, last year I took the, uh, the virtual exchange course. I'm not too sure right now what the formal name was oh my goodness it's leaving my mind but um it was disability it was, and culture i think it was culture and disability, was disability something like that and culture. it was a psychology course but it was like a yeah. it was the brazilian version of a, a special topics course in psychology and then colon dis and the and the special topic yeah. was disability and culture and then there was obviously a separate name um in portuguese uh i would say first and foremost a very uh accessible course uh just uh, in terms of sort of having things on Google Meet, uh, being able to schedule, uh, we had group uh, meetings uh, and participation that was separate from the lectures every week that we could pick um, and determine, okay, hey, this week or this time during this week doesn't work for me and that's okay. And so it was, I mean, for a summer course, not sort of overly burdened and stressful, um, but engaging enough that, you know, every week I felt like I was coming to class, learning something, being able to make connections um, things were, our readings were available. Um, you could choose English or Portuguese um, with translations. Um, if sort of you, you wanted to either take the leap to read something that wasn't your, uh, your given content. Um, and then we had, I believe there was an hour and a half to three hours, I would say maximum, um, were our sort of virtual lecture time. Um, and I was, I mean, I, it was the only summer course I took and I was able to manage working a full-time job while doing it um, because of the way that the assessments worked. Um, Professor Block is super great with sort of flexibility. So for my final assessment, I was able to do um, sort of a, a mixed media um, large drawing with an artist statement, uh, which for me was a format that really, really worked. Um, and then people had also the option to do essays. So in terms of sort of like course structure and evaluation, um, a really, really rewarding um, and rich and incredible environment. Um, in terms of sort of the connections, um, that was probably my personal favorite part was that sort of cultural exchange. Um, my group mostly spoke in English, but they also had Portuguese language groups. Um, and so we had sort of a mix of Canadian students and a mix of, um, I would say about two thirds Portuguese students. Um, and it was small, I mean, six people. Um, so I guess, you know, split up whatever the two thirds, four of that. Um, and so two Canadian students. So it was really interesting to see about, okay, I mean, they had, all had fantastic English levels, but some of them were still trying to better to sort of pursue further education in North America um, in English um, and sort of hearing everyone's perspectives because, uh, because it was a USKI course, uh, they had some masters and PhD students. So they were able to sort of bring their really unique um, and interesting experience um, of their lives studying uh, disability and anthropology within Brazil um, and sort of me being able to sort of bring my connections as a Western student. Um, that for me was uh, really great. Sort of just having like a WhatsApp and then um, continued connection on Instagram still um, and sort of being able to see what they post. Um, and, you know, like one of the, one of, uh, one of my group members is now sort of in New York uh, doing a year in, of her PhD uh, within anthropology, um, and she's from Brazil. So 
I think just the those sort of sheer connections and um, cultural exchange was probably my favorite part um, on top of the lessons uh, and on top of the um, sort of very manageable readings. Um, because I think sort of through conversation, uh, you're able to, I mean, have those cultural connections, but also sort of see, okay, what are similarities? You know, there's different history, there's different but similar histories for things um, like transatlantic enslavement for eugenics movements. I mean, there's crossroads, but you know, Brazil had a lot later time within emancipation and there was different protocols and different policies and sort of how that affects things like disability, like race, like gender, um, were all really fascinating for me to look, to learn about. So I really, really enjoyed it. I, I mean, I personally couldn't recommend it um, anymore if you're thinking of taking a summer course, uh, if you're interested, even if you're like, oh, I'm not the most interested in Brazil, but um, it's still a fascinating way to connect with people sort of around the world and see similarities and differences. So um, yeah, from my perspective, it was, I thought it was really successful too. And I, I, I think it was really clever the way that we organized things so that we could negotiate language differences so that um, lectures were happening in English, lectures, some lectures were in English and some were in Portuguese, but we had somebody um, translating. It wasn't simultaneous translation, but like someone would talk and then somebody who else would come in and translate. And, um, and that ended up working better for us. We tried captioning and auto, like captions with auto translation, but that didn't work as well. Um, and so, um, I mean, we still had our talks captioned. Um, it was, I think, pretty accessible for everyone who needed it to be. And one of the issues with um, access going down to Brazil um, is that the classes will probably still be virtual, even for the people who are going down to Brazil, because our instructor is deaf and reads lips. So to have it in person in a classroom with everybody with masks is not going to work for her. So the you know even if we're down there, the, the class person, and even if we're together, um, you know it it will still. Uh, no, I guess we, we can't be together. We're all going to have to be separate for, for the, at least for the class. But the class, um, as Michaela talked about, we only, um, it was a six week course and we met synchronously once per week. The only change that we might have if we decide to do it in three weeks instead of six is that we might, you know, meet twice a week instead of once a week. Uh, that would make it a little more intensive. But I really liked the six week course um, because people, I think, I believe that people need time to do the readings and um, absorb the readings. Like there's just so much reading that you can do in a week. And I forgot to mention the journals, um, which I think oh, yeah. with, with the six week sort of, um, I guess more intense, I didn't find it incredibly intensive, but you know, I guess technically compared to the normal school year intensive. Um, I really, really like the journal format um, because uh, sort of we had the opportunity to have the lecture, you know, you have the readings that you come to class, or the synchronous class having done, and then you also have um, your hour or hour and a half, however long your um, informal group discussion meeting. Um, and so you can kind of bring all of those things together uh, in your journal. Uh, and that really helps sort of uh, gauge and, and at least guide your own learning because you know sometimes in online environments it's not as easy to either you know get help or reflect or you know have that sort of after class discussions with the prof or um friends so i think the the journal aspects of really at least help me um sort of process and realize okay this is what i've learned this week or you know i can take a load off by putting this onto my journal page um and then you know revisiting it um a week after and yeah, so it, it really allowed people to also match the readings and the themes and the, the topics of the readings to real world examples as well. So that we're not just looking at theories or abstract ideas, but we're also linking it to actual historical events or, or social media or cultural, um, uh, you know, like film or art or something like that, reading books, you know, something from literature that, um, that resonated with the themes and, and the different themes for the courses, um, again, you know, race and gender, um, different disability experiences, um, different time periods, uh, looking at things like ableism and eugenics, 
um, and how things might differ in, in, in the global north versus um, uh, in Brazil. And, um, and, and as Michaela noted, the, we, we, are, we have readings on each topic available in both English and Portuguese. And so each individual student could decide, could pick um, a selection of readings like that, you know, we might have six possible readings and, and then ask students to, to choose, you know, two to three um, to read each week, for example. Sometimes there were more readings than that to, to choose from. Um, and sometimes there were films that might be captioned in both English and Portuguese. Um, in fact, we tried to match the themes with like relevant documentaries or films. And um, uh, and I think that this worked pretty well. So even though people weren't necessarily like reading the exact same things, they had enough common ground that when they were meeting in their small groups, and as Michaela noted that the groups, there, there, there were a lot more that this, this past year, there were a lot more Brazilian students than um, students from Canada. Um, but many of the students wanted the, to be able to have the small group discussions in English. So we had two groups that um, met um, where the primary language was English. And then we had, and we also had some Canadian students that preferred to, um, to, to be in the Portuguese speaking groups as well. Um, and so we had, I think, four um, Portuguese speaking groups. And we also had a mix of both undergraduate and graduate students, both in Brazil and um, from Canada. So it was really like, and, and, and I think people really liked having that, you know, uh, for the undergraduate students, it was great to get the perspectives of the graduate students and the opportunity of the graduate students to mentor emerging scholars, the undergraduate scholars was, I think, also um, also really helpful. And there was like a definitely an atmosphere of mutual support that I think permeated the course and and people really, you know, connected. I think some people are still, you know, connecting on WhatsApp and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, keeping in touch. So. And I think that that sort of relationship building will get only stronger when we go down to Brazil. And especially we're planning to do this every year. You know, it's going to be, it's probably going to be a little strange this coming year with, um, you know, especially depending on what the, what COVID restrictions might be in place in Brazil. Um, and then, but we're hoping that, you know, this is something that we're going to be re repeating every year. And as things get more back to normal, um, you know, the, the opportunities and, and options for things that we can safely do will expand. Um, uh, do you have any questions? So I'm just, yeah. Hi, sorry, I just had to. I was in a quiet space, but um, I was wondering what the application process is for this program. Okay, so our application isn't live yet, I, um, but it's going to be through Atlas, and we'll be having, our goal is to have it up um, uh, sometime next week, but I can't promise. <laughs> I'll do the best I can. I know that the deadline for undergraduate um, financial aid through um, Western International is coming up, but there's a series of deadlines. There's like a there's, um, uh, they, they have different, you can apply, um, I think in December, and then there's going to be another um, application process for financial aid in February. But I'm gonna do the best I can to get our application up for, um, uh, for, for the earlier deadline. Uh, and I want, I, I'm gonna be taking a really small group, so it's gonna be pretty competitive, but um, I am open to taking both undergraduates and graduate students. Um, I don't know what funding might be available. We don't, I don't, the program doesn't have any funding for students. Like funding would have to come from whatever financial aid or, or funding resources are available through the university or through your departments um, or, you know, whatever other um, uh, funding sources might be available for people for international travel. Um, the, there'll be um, like a small amount, like maybe $500 for people who want to um, just engage virtually and don't want to travel. And for the people who want to travel, it'll probably be, the fee will probably be about $1,000. And as I said, I think a good chunk of both of those amounts can be covered by um, financial aid for undergraduates through Western International. And there may be um, travel funding available through, um, through grad for graduate students as well. It's a different pathway that I'm not as familiar with. 
Um, but I do know, I do remember from my own students that there are ways that, that people can get like small travel grants. Um, and um, the students will, each student will be responsible for paying for their own airfare and uh, room and, and, and some, some amount of food. We'll be providing some food, but like, we'll, you know, there'll be some collective meals, lunches, dinners, et cetera. Um, but, uh, but we're expecting that, um, that students will find their own housing, will have, will offer options for people, but people will just decide on their own housing and we'll do what we can to, um, uh, to figure out transportation options. Um, but I, I do believe like there are like taxis and Uber and stuff like that, but I'm, I'm hoping that we can find, um, housing options that are pretty close together so that, you know, it won't be that complicated for us to, and we can like share, um, we can either share transportation or hire a driver or something like that to work with us. That sort of thing I do have a little funding for. Um, but um, so the main expenses for students will be the, the airfare um, and uh, room, some food costs and, uh, and some like local travel costs probably. And, uh, but we would be, uh, you know, uh, we would be providing some programming and, uh, you know, and the, um, and, you know, all of the, the costs associated with the, the um, uh, you know, any uh, cultural uh, visits that we might be doing, any kind of tourist type stuff or um, sort of in-person activities. Any other questions? Okay, do you have anything else you want to add, Michaela? I guess, yeah. Um, the only thing is some of the, uh, there's a lot of like, which I mean, I don't know if it's bureaucracy, I'm not sure what it is, but there's a lot of sort of fine lines within like the Western international funding. Um, and I've been reading into a ton of it because I'm planning my exchange for next year. Um, and so some of the, some of the sort of smaller travel grants that are anywhere from like sort of 1,000, 2,500, 5,000, I think is, I don't know if that's the largest amount. Um, some of them you can't combine with other Western-based scholarships or other merit or need-based scholarships. And some of them are only, um, but some of them are compatible as, you know, you only have, you either have only been eligible for work study or bursaries. Um, and so you can, you know, apply for it. Um, but just to be, that's sort of something to keep in mind is um, to read through uh, the requirements or sort of the preferences that Western has when they're choosing who to fund um, if it's if you're thinking you're going to be able to rely on it and it maybe turns out that um, you're not eligible for um, international um, aid like travel grant funding and i'm also happy to facilitate like if students that are interested in doing this exchange you know want to do some fundraisers on campus um, again as a as somebody who's relatively new to the university i don't know the rules associated with that but i know that our anthro undergrad and grad societies do fundraisers where they like bake sales and and that kind of thing so i'm totally open to supporting those kinds of efforts if people want to um fundraise to different different cost of um of attending uh, i also want to specify that um the amounts that i quoted are for um, 2022 for May 2022. This is our pilot year, so I'm not going to guarantee that that's those are always for the future going to be the costs. The costs might change from year to year, but we're trying to just keep the costs low because this is our first time trying this out, and um, there's going to be an element of you know let's see how it works. <laughs> so, um, any other questions or comments? Everybody's good. Okay, so those of you who are listening to this, if you have questions, you can email me, Pamela Block. So my email is pblock at uwo.ca. And um, you can also um, find me on social media, also Pamela Block at Western. And um, you can, uh, you know, you can, you can try to, to comment, you know, and ask questions below the video or in the social media posts, but probably emailing me directly or messaging me through social media um, is the fastest and most surest way to, to get a response from me. And I guess if anyone has um, questions about the, like the, I guess the course content format, 
um, difficulty, pace, skill, whatever, um, you're welcome to sort of email me or reach out to Professor Block um, and ask. Um, I'm, I'm always happy to sort of share uh, um, experiences on um, sort of exchange um, types of platforms and whatnot. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to connect people to, um, to Michaela and other people who have completed the summer course if you have any questions. And, um, and again, I'm, I'm happy to, I'm pretty accessible. And for students who have taken courses with me before, there's definitely some elements of similarity in terms of the way I have essays and journals and alternate format assignments. The difference is that for some people who have taken asynchronous courses, with me, this course does have a synchronous component, which it's kind of, it's a much harder to do um, exchange activities when it's asynchronous. So we, we definitely have um, through the small group discussions and through um, the weekly lectures, we have components where we are all gathered together at the same time. Thank you everyone. And uh, Again, I, I look forward to hearing from uh, from people and uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to making this trip with a group of students this coming May. Thank you.